talking, no matter what, no talking, okay? Can you turn off the music? Thank you. Facebook. Welcome to Comic Spot, episode number 644 or something. Today I have a new background. Yep. Yes, looks nice. Thank you, Ying. Yes, comedy beautiful. Chateau is a new comedy club that's opened up in North Hollywood. Catch Felix McNulty on Facebook. Look at his website. Oh my gosh, they have fine dining. Three rooms, two indoors, one out. Today, this episode is brought to you by the Comedy Chateau. Woohoo! Yes, and today, somebody I know and love from, I met her in Portland when I was there at Harvey's, and she got to see what a witch I was under stress. <laughs> yes, Linda. That's true. Today, my esteemed guest, an eight-year veteran of comedy, let me read you her introduction. Her name is Ying Vigilon, and every host mispronounces her name. Stop doing that. <laughs> Ask people how they want their name pronounced. Oh, they can say Ying Vagina. That looks <laughs> like that. <laughs> so let me read you her intro. She has done comedy on and off for eight years. Now still keeps a day job. It's about time to quit her eight to five. She's performed all over the Northwest, which I happen to know is true, during <laughs> 2020. She did several comedy festivals and competitions. And anytime I go to a mic or a class, Ying is there. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Linda. She's a single mother com and a comedian, and I respect her her drive and her hard work, her perseverance. And I personally have seen her go from almost funny to hilarious, just like <laughs> me. Thank you, Ying, for being here. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I'm happy to be here. And you're my role model, oh, just to let you know, yes. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you. I, great. I love your comedy. I love you doing this podcast. Yes, yeah, just love it. I watched a lot of your interviews. You know, you posted on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Thank I you love so it. Much. Yes. I love, I love that. Thank you. So I'm much. I'm big fan of you. Just to let you know. Yes. And I'm a big fan of yours. Your comedy is so good. Oh, oh thank you, Linda. Thank you. That's a good promotion for me <laughs> on your live show. Yes, and and you are a very inspired. Mary, you're my role model. Yeah. Thank you. I love your garden behind you. Yeah. Thanks to my neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So it's a good virtue. Now we're all virtue. So, yeah. Borrow some fun yeah. joke there. Okay. Good. <laughs> I love that you went and took a picture of, of your neighbor's yard and have it as your background. It's hilarious. Yes. Uh, during the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. You know, the, the spring. It's a yeah. beautiful patio. Very beautiful. That's neighbor too. Yeah. That's it. Well, let's talk about you, Ying. I want okay. my people to get to know you and love you and follow you. Super. Yes. So let's go way back to your beginning. You you must have started very small. Am I right? Yes, from baby, just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Tell me but, about uh, growing up. Yeah, uh, I grown up in China in the 60s. Let's just go back to that far. And I was an unwanted child, accidental, because I already have a brother, sister. They're about uh, nine and 10 years older than me. So my mother got me and just not happy. So that's kind of like... Uh, seal my fate and plus when my mom told me what when she was pregnant of me i was upside down my feet is down so she think i was a curse to her life she was yeah but at the time in china you there you cannot get abortion you see not like later right they have one child 
policy, you know. So my mother have to carry me the full term, you know, and, and but she just didn't like me. So that, yeah, ever since I was born, but she did some exercise to turn turn things around. So I was eventually head first out to the world, you know. Uh, but so that is, uh, so I, I would say my childhood was not happy because my mother was playing favor. She likes my sister more than me. So I always had a hand-me-down clothes. Uh, I didn't talk about those in my comedy because a lot of uh, sad stories and pretty depressed, you know, I, I try to, because now I'm in America, I'm happy now, you know, get over all those uh, uh, hard times with my family, you know, so that's kind of a very short uh, introduction of my myself <laughs> coming yeah. to the world. But I think I, I could use some of the therapy sessions but i think comedy is one of the therapy for me you know that because childhood trauma uh, take a long time to get rid of you know or, or overcome you know because i so i experience inequality right in my home i i tell you this i just give you a little bit of truth up until i was 18 years old i don't remember i got any new clothes and shoes See how sad that is for a little girl. Always from my sister and the cousin, uh, hand me down. Wow. I know it's even my family in Beijing, China, we're not poor. My mom and dad actually make pretty good money. I mean, their standard at that time. So we were middle class. It totally was my mom's doing to, to me. I was not going to blame poor China. No, it was my mom's single-handedly playing favoritism to my sister. So I experienced a lot of emotional issues. You know, so the first time, first chance I got to leave home is going to college. I pick a college that I could go as further south as possible because my hometown, Beijing, is north of China, the right, capital city. I first picked Guangzhou because I was a very good student at school because that's one place I can find love is at school. You know, the teacher likes me, you know, they love because I'm very smart, you know, everything. Um, but eventually, my, my father, though, he did not play favoritism. My father treat me okay. They don't ap approve that I go to Guangzhou province to go to university. So my my uh, my dad said, let's compromise. So we draw a line between Beijing and the Guangzhou, cut in the middle. The middle is uh, Shanghai, you know, Shanghai. So I said, no, I don't want to go to Shanghai. So we settled to a city, Hangzhou, uh, Zhejiang University. It's very famous, we call it the East, uh, Eastern or Asia MIT, you know, MIT in the United States. So that's how good of technology and engineering school of Zhejiang University. That's where I went because I just want to get away from home. So and that is kind of a start of my own life. I feel like now I need to be under the shadow of my family. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so, okay. Have you been funny your whole life just to cope? No, I think I was not because I think as a child, as but my brother, my older brother was very funny. Yeah, I think I learned a lot of jokes from, from him, even though my older brother, he went through a lot of a personal tragedy himself. But for some reason, he always managed to tell jokes and, and just... Uh, I, I had a lot of laugh, actually, from my older brother. You know, he always come home and tell us a joke. But, of course, in Chinese, you know, it's China joke. So, I, yeah, <laughs> I can't tell them here. Yeah. Have you ever done comedy in China? Well, that's later. Later on, yes. The last few years, I when I went back to China visit, I always try to go to, uh, uh, in Beijing, they have an open mic, too. Wow. I did. I did several of them. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's go back to college. You're in college now. Yeah. 
and you haven't really been known for being funny and you went through a lot of childhood trauma and you're in college and you're able to focus and get good grades and get into a great college? Uh, not really. That's the thing about me. Funny is in college, I was a total rebellion, you know, uh, because I studied chemistry. That was my major, but I was not interested in that at all. I was totally into Western culture. So I took a lot of uh, classes like philosophy and uh, Western art history. So I was totally in different direct and liberal art instead of uh, engineering, you know? And so that was my first, I was almost uh, expelled from school because for like a year, I didn't go to classes. I just doing my own thing. I, I didn't go to classes of required class. You were yeah, because yeah, rebellion, and I just feel so free now at university, and uh, you know, uh, the, I think that was the first sign of me different that I realized I was different. Yeah, I, I, I just, at university. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> How did your family, did they come around to being more supportive after you went to college? And now, how are things? You know, right now, I'm an adult. They have no control over me, right? But and when I was in college, uh, same thing. They couldn't, because so far away. I was not in Beijing there, right? But I think it was last year in college, uh, when I call my, I was going through once again a lot of trauma, but it's it's a different with it's a date with a boyfriend kind of thing. I call my dad. I said I want to take a year off, just go home. And my dad on the phone says, "Were you pregnant?" Wow, that was very shocking in China. You know, to even think a college student can have sex at the time it was eighties. By then it was in the eighties. Very shocking. So. At that moment, I realized even my dad mentioned that. Wow, I was thinking maybe I went too far. Maybe I shouldn't quit college one year. Maybe I should keep going just because I'm getting like D. I was almost couldn't pass a grade because I didn't go to classes, right? That's so I so I told my dad, okay, uh, you know what? I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna finish school. And that's what I did for three months. I almost didn't sleep. I studied all night, you know, past like two or three o'clock. I just studied the whole new textbook because I didn't go to class. And so I, I determined I'm gonna pass the grade that required, which is 60 point, you know, like in a 100 point system, if I pass 60, I pass, I can graduate. Oh. Yeah, so I totally studied self-study, several subjects. And I pass all of them. So I eventually graduate. Yeah, because I don't want my dad worry. You know, I didn't say, well, so, oh no, I, first of all, I wasn't pregnant. My problem was not that. But to the level that he worried, that was my problem. So otherwise, why you want to quit school for a year, right? So I determined I'm going to have to pass. So I did. Uh, <laughs> so, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I was, yeah. I was, it was a total mess in, in, in school at the college, but I did it. I did it on my own, you know. Another thing is in South, they have totally different dialect. So I had a trouble understand teacher. You know, the Southern language is kind of like a foreign language to me. Every single teacher have a very heavy accents when they try to speak Mandarin, Chinese. So I struggle just to understand what teacher was saying. So that's another thing. Yeah, and also the south, uh, the climate. I just have also went through a health issue too. I was sick because I was from north. The totally different climate. It's, I, I tell you, the city is almost like Houston. Very hot and humid in the summer, right? It's, just imagine you're like from uh, north. Uh, Canada, all of a sudden you move to a southern city of Houston. That was kind of a change to me. In Beijing, it was very dry, you know, uh, kind of, it's kind of like Spokane. Then you move to Houston. 
Oh God, it's just a lot to deal with, but I did it. You know, I did it. Yes, well, yeah. you went through a lot. You're yeah, I know. Fighting. Yeah, I know. So yeah, but that's kind of a, a laid a foundation for my personality to yes. being tough, right? And you know, and on my own, do my own thing. Um, yeah, and also when I was at school university, I got that reputation. You know, the the guy just say, Yin is kind of out of this world. She just her own person. Is that in and out because I don't go to classes, I just do my own thing. Then all of a sudden showed up when the exam time came. You know, it's like they never see me study because I study when they all sleep, right? That's study all night long. I showed up for the exam and I pass it. It wasn't that great, but I passed every single subject just by studying the textbook myself. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> You're a very good student, and I see you taking a lot of classes in comedy, but we'll get to that later. So let's okay. go from college. Tell me what happened after college. Some things happened, and now you're here blessing us in America. Yeah. You're doing uh, comedy in America. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. After college, uh, I got a job. Uh, I was a teaching at a, a kind of trade school. Those school is like between high school and the college. So it's a, it's, it's a student that couldn't pass the exam. You know, the China have the national exam system to go to college. So those students, they, they couldn't do that, so they go to a trade school to get a job. So I was teaching there as a teacher, teaching chemistry, you know, and I also did some environmental work too, you know, so that's kind of a help to me to get uh, a job in the United States after I get my master's. So I did that a couple of years and uh, uh, I wasn't happy. So I, I came to United States to get my master's degree. It's kind of like a school thing is I use that as a tool to turn my life around. So like the first time is all about get away from my family, right? The second time is really about my career and also my life because I always love Western culture, United States. It's like my dream, right? So that when I wasn't happy with life in China, I was like, okay, I need to go to America. Because I, I read a lot of books, uh, literature, you know, books. So um, to prepare that, you have to pass it called TOEFL to get your language ready. So same same thing again, I need to ta pass a lot of English tests and apply for graduate school. So I did all that. I came here by myself once again, single lady, come to United States. Yeah. So talk to me about the fact that at some point you now have children and yes. you're semi-grown or grown? I have a three. I have a daughter just graduated from college. So she's now living in Seattle area. Uh, and I have a son, 17 year old. Right now I'm living with him, but he will go to college this year. And also I adopted a black girl. It's my daughter. It's funny that I made, I told a lot of jokes about my relationship. So three relationship, serious relationship without three kids. Yeah, uh, the, the black girl, I dated her father. So they're uh, from Africa, Ghana, but we never married. We just dated, you know, and they moved in with me. Uh, eventually things didn't work out. So uh, the father, which is my boyfriend, moved out, uh, but I kept the girl, the daughter. So she's now my daughter. So I have a <laughs> three, of course, biological kids. I have a daughter and a son if from two different white men. You know, of course, they're from two failed relationships, once again. <laughs> yeah. So that's very short version of my my life here in United States. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. I could I could tell jokes off just by my life, you know, by, by my three relationship, right? Yeah, I I told some, but very short ones. Yeah. I've heard them. I've heard a few of them. Yeah. Very yeah. funny. I try to make a joke out of it instead of feeling sad about myself. 
or feeling failed. It's like, no, okay, I might be bad, like, uh, relation, but I'm a good mother. I'm very good single mother. I'm very proud of my three kids. You know, uh, the I'll tell you the good news is my daughter, uh, Vera, which is from Africa. She just accepted by Air Force. So she's joined the Air Force. Uh, she's leaving home in June. And my son is going to college in June, right? I mean, he's going to graduate uh, high school in May. And uh, so he's getting several scholarships from university. So we're still waiting for more. So by June, I'll be single again in my house, just by myself. <laughs> wow. Because my daughter's already, the, my oldest daughter, he's already out many years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have... <laughs> I know somebody who can help you get more money and get into college. You know the name Lori Laughlin? No. It's a joke. She went okay. to prison because she she paid the college money to take her kids. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I, I'm not worried about my son. He's very smart. He's a straight A, you know, uh, all that. And my daughter now in the, in the Army and in the Air Force, I would say, the biggest socialist in America, I'm happy. I think she is a safe, you know, she is a taken care of and she's a very hardworking person. I think she'll do great. She'll finish her college degree because she's working on her nursing degree. So she will uh, finish that in, in, in the Air Force and she'll do great. She's going to be either nurse or dental assistant, you know, hygienist. So, so good. All my kids are doing great. I'm very proud of them. Yes, that's awesome. Yeah, oh. so I just have to worry about myself, you know. Yes, that's what happens when we become empty nesters. Then we get to decide what we're going to do for ourselves. Yes, yes. Yeah. So. so, okay, so what made you decide to go into comedy, Ying? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a funny story because the first time I even know comedy was my son's father. When we were dating, he took me to a comedy show. That was the first time I even see a live comedy. Uh, so I, but, but one thing shocking to me, I was sitting there for like hour and a half. I'll tell you now, 70% of the thing, I didn't understand. I don't know what the comic was saying. Everybody left and right, they were laughing. And just this, because I always saw my English good, right? So when I couldn't understand 70% of what they're saying, that just bothered the heck out of me, right? Because I couldn't laugh. Everybody else is laughing. So I said, wow, this is not good. So I keep going back. Even back then, my boyfriend didn't want to watch comedy show. I just go buy a ticket and go watch myself because I want to understand. You know, that's one of the personality about me is if something I don't understand, it bothers me. If that's good, everybody's laughing, everybody enjoy it, but I don't understand, no way in hell. You know, I'm, I want to understand. I, so I started watching comedy. I started watching YouTube. And then, so the more I know about it, uh, the more I like it. Because guess what? In China, we do not have stand-up comedy. Uh, in China, what we have is called cross-talk. There are two people talking. That's our comedy format in China, but we don't have single person stand up comedy. Yeah, so that's how I got started, you know. And uh, and also another story, I have a friend that her husband told me that they, it's Chinese, Chinese. So one time he was the guy was doing his post PhD, right? So he went to uh, Las Vegas just for fun, right? So he went to a comedy show. Same thing. He said, everybody was laughing, you know, left and right. He was only one not laughing because he did not understand the joke. So it was very shocking experience to him, to this Chinese guy. So he told me at that moment, he decided America is not for him. He decided to go back to China to develop, you know, his career because he said, what good is it? If I'm here, I live in this country, you know, material wise is all good, but culturally, I'm outsider. I don't know anything about the culture and the, 
So he said, this is not for me. So he went back. It just showed the different personality because when I experienced the same that I couldn't understand, I decided to get into it, to know. Instead of this person say, hey, I'm Pai Kama Lee because I don't understand America. You know, it's kind of like if you cannot laugh together, then you, you then you know it's it's no fun. It's it's not this place is not for you. So he left. He left America. He permanently moved back to China. Wow. Yeah, that's that's what he told me. You know, that what I'm telling you is comedy and jokes have that kind of a huge impact to people's life. People actually make life decisions based on whether or not they understand the joke. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You know, and, and I heard Chinese people were saying that people here says that if they don't understand comedy or something, they don't feel like they understand the mainstream of America. But some of them, they're okay to live in that their little isolated Chinese community because you can still do that in America, right? We are a diverse society. But for me, I wanted to understand the main mainstream of America. Not only I want to understand, I want to be part of it. That's why I'm doing comedy, because I like it. And, and I do think I am funny, you know, London, because my life is, my life itself, I tell you, it's, it's a kind of a funny story. Just a lot of up and down, roller coaster, contradiction. It's an excellent comedy material. I was only scratched the surface. I haven't really read anything about my childhood, my family back in China. I, but there's a lot of material because sometimes it's too deep when you have to dig that deep, right? That it's yeah, I don't know because it's it's I don't want to tell it as a sad story, you know. That much I tell you. Even though it is, it is a sad story, very depressed because it tied to old China. And I tell you, old China is an old sad country. That is true. Not of course, not now. Now they look great. They're they're you know they're uh, their people are rich, have money. They're rising. Not way back then. Not like 40, 50 years ago. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you started comedy here, and mm -hmm. how has it been going the first time and since then? And how have people come along to help you, or have you just done it all on your own? How are things? Yeah, I think I would say pretty much so far, I, I've done it on my own. Uh, locally, the uh, Spokane comedy scene, I would say actually they have a very good uh, comedy club, very quality, because they bring in very name, big name comics, you know, when they're doing the tour. So so that was good. good. I, I was had a chance to watch them. But when I started, though, uh, we didn't have that kind of good quality comedy club so when I did the most uh, open mics I didn't feel the old timers or establishment of, of comedy very supportive of me uh, so I have to fight my ways through of course one thing is I wasn't that good the people saying I don't have punchline probably a lot of <laughs> you know a lot, lot of uh, uh, this premise you know I have good stories uh, so I, I'm learning along the way you know so you can start with good uh, premise you know i i have i mean yeah i mean sometimes if funny story it can be funny you know but i think the pandemic actually helped me the first time i've taken uh the comedy classes you know I, okay let, let's go back before the pandemic i think it was 2019 I took a comedy class, which is in Seattle. I had to drive to Seattle to take uh, classes as Peter Gray. Peter Gray is the teacher. So that was the only comedy class I took 2019. Yeah. And the 2020, I took a lot of online zone class. I was surprised even all these classes were out there. And actually the comic are so supportive. I was very surprised. Because I can tell you, locally, I, I, I know if the Spokane comic is listening, watching me right now, they're not going to be happy because they were not nice to me. Some of, of them are mean, and, you know, but 
I was surprised so many comics from East Coast, New York, Boston area. They're so supportive. They have feedback, Mike. I would say I learned so much from those comics. And, and there's so many comedians are not like zero sum game. They literally try to help you. I was very surprised to even find out the comments are out there. I because in my thinking, I'm saying it's a competition between your your comic friends, you know. But now I realize it's not. People really want to help you, you know. So happy to find and also teachers too. I took classes uh in the uh, comedy club in New York. I think Linda, I would thank you. Uh I think it's a uh, Ross. Ross is a uh, you interviewed him. Ross Bennett. That's, yes, Ross Bennett. That's where I find out the, the class. So I I uh, signed up that uh, he's a very good teacher. And of course, uh, Flapper comedy class. I took uh, uh, several classes there. Yeah. And what else? Uh, right now, I'm Jerry doing Cor Jerry Corley. Jerry. Oh, right, right. Jerry Corley. Right. Jerry Corley. Right. Online classes. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I like, I enjoy his classes too. Right. Okay. Came, oh, right. A year ago, you came to Vegas and took it in person. Right. right in class. Right. So, right. Now I remember. So, before pandemic, I took two. One is a Peter Gray, one is a Jerry Coley. Right. So, that is a one week, right? It's one week, very short comedy writing class. Yeah. I learned a lot, a lot of that too. Yeah. So, now the online save you all this travel. And the hotel costs, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much nicer. Right. But I, I would say I stopped comedy for two or three years because I have the lower back pain, you know, so I couldn't even stand up straight. Yeah, that was that bad. So eventually I had a surgery, I think 2017 or 2018. But I I had a started to develop problem in 2014, uh, 15. Yeah, it's really, really bad. Really, really bad. And during that time, I started taking drugs, you know, uh, oxycodone, hydrocodone, you know, and, and I tried marijuana. You try to stop the pain. You have to, you know, you're des I was desperate. I was willing to try anything to stop the pain. So that's why I said on and off. Yep. You know, I, yeah, I, for two or three years, I didn't do much. Probably just once or twice, a few times a year, went to the open mic. I couldn't stand up straight. I don't want people to see me, you know, leaning over like old lady, you know? So, yeah, so I, I got to write a lot of uh, comedy piece for that too. But you know what? During those times, I did uh, uh, Toastmaster Public I Speaking I Club. Yeah. I I, yeah, I, I did that. So I started Toastmaster way before i did comedy me too yeah so yeah and you know, i every, everything that you've said about your life is exactly what i've been through everything oh. all along the way i could say me too me too me too <laughs> we really should get together linda we have yeah we so need to talk about common. yeah i up. know i know yeah but you're such a happy person always have big smile very positive. I don't see, you know, this uh, sadness in you. So how do you do it? You know, that's what I'm saying. You are my role model. Oh. I have a lot to learn from you. Okay. We need to team up and doing some, do something. Let's go around the country. There's one comedian in Los Angeles, Carol Johnson. Mm -hmm. Maybe the three of us can go around the country and do three women. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we, all, I, we would all get along. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah, because I went to graduate school here in United States, right? One of my classmates uh, is a Chinese. Uh, he told me that he said every time I talk to you, see you, you're so positive. You always. I said really. He said yeah. I don't see any sad in you. I didn't know you went through such such a bad life experience when you were young. So, and he always also asked me, why you stay so young? You know, I, I don't see you aging at all. I said, well, there you have it. Just stay positive, you know, happy. That's one thing can keep you young, right? Just be, have, always have a positive attitude. 
even the shit coming to you. You you give out, you spit out flowers. Okay. So I was like, yeah, I, you know, I don't go around complaining about life. I don't, you know, even there's so many shit hit me, my life. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Even if you don't have a really nice garden, you just go take a picture of your neighbors. I know exactly. The, I take it as my garden, you know, I don't care. I put it on my virtue, uh, you know, background, you know, I own it. Hey, that's mine, you know, yeah. When you but, become famous. And they <laughs> one day, I hope one day, I mean, before I die, I, I don't know if I can live that long, but uh, yeah. When you become famous and they see you on the news with their background. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, way back then, right? I interviewed with Linda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I also have a, go ahead, Linda. What, you go ahead and finish what you were going to say. Okay, I have a Chinese friend. Uh, she's a few years older than me. And she one time called me, says, Yin, what the cream that you use? Because I see your skin very good, you know, like, so I told her, I said, well, actually, I don't use any, just water. I just watered, like, really? She couldn't believe me. I said, yeah. I mean, so then once again, I went on about stay positive, just be happy, you know, or she, she is happily married. She probably feels sorry for me, you know, seeing her, she tried to introduce a boyfriend and stuff. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay being a single mother, you know, maybe someday I'll run into some guy, you know, we, we both like, and then we'll go from there, you know, but, but I really, I don't know. I, to be honest with you, I don't know why I stay young. I, I look, I got gray hair. It's not that, you know, I got, <laughs> I got it, but yeah. Uh, when I tell people's age, they wouldn't believe, you know, but uh, I think uh, keep a positive attitude is one big thing to stay young. You know? yes, yeah. Yes, I do too. I do too. Mm -hmm. And you and I have been through lots of trauma. Yeah. And so uh, every morning I try to get in touch with the little girl before the trauma. Yes. We all have a little girl. We can remember how happy we were before some stuff happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think my nature, my na nature is happy person. It just, what happened things I didn't have a control kind of suppress my nature. So that's why my instinct, the, the first time I was able to make my own decision, my instinct is to stay away from this negativity, which is my family. I moved to the South, even though there's so many other difficulty I have to deal with, but still psychologically, I was better, you know? Um, yeah, so just by instinct, I always wanted to, to stay happy and, and be a positive person. So once I have that totally free, I'm always a happy person, you know? Yeah, to give a biggest smile. And, and also I tell you the, how I took ne negative as a positive. I tell you the reason uh, my uh, relationship with my the black boyfriend broke up is actually she got thousands of dollars from me. I mean, this is a, another story. But the way I look at it is, hey, that is a charity, right? Instead of donating, why can't I just give to him? If he wants it, even if he make up story, you know, he, his father died twice in order to get money from me. So it's okay. I'd rather to believe that is the case instead of donate to church. I donate, if I could make one person life better, I'll do it. I was even willing to be tricked into, I don't think I lose because I think the life have cycle. Look at what I got, his daughter. Now it's my daughter. She is a wonderful girl. I really think it totally worth it. Totally worth it. What a beautiful yeah. way to look at that. Oh yeah, I, I totally, if someone else come along, along the way, try to trick me, thousands of thousands of dollars, I would have happy to do it again. Aww, yeah, beautiful. yes, you know, yes, no problem. But see, that's why you never hear me talk bad about black people. No. I don't, even though uh, personal, but because I understand their circumstances, 
why they did what they did, why they said what they said, you know, until we can, our whole society, America, can solve this inequality problem. You know what I'm saying? I'm not blaming any individual. I don't. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. What do you want to accomplish with your comedy in the next five years? Of course, five years, I want to be a full-time comedian. So that's number one. Uh, then I wanted to develop a fresh, new, different kind of uh, comedy in terms of material, because I'm going to talk about different things of, uh, you know, like uh, Margaret Cho or Ali Wong, all these uh, female Asian performers did. Uh, so that's kind of what I had in mind. Then I'll just go from there. I mean, eventually my final goal may it'd be nice if I have a Netflix special, right? <laughs> yeah. It'll like be dry nice. Bar, yeah. Dry bar comedy. Dry bar comedy too. Yeah, that will be a, a good one too. But I think the biggest exposure I would say is Netflix, especially because I've seen some of the comedy new ones. They have 15 minutes. 30 minutes on Netflix. You don't have to be one whole hour. 30 minutes is fine. 15 minutes is fine. You know, and the dry bar comedy, I think I have less exposure, but it will be nice. You know, it will be nice. And dry bar have a lot of limit. You got to clean and all that. I, I don't think Netflix have those limits, right? No, yeah, I the, don't think so. Yeah, I, I have to watch some of the Netflix comics, so dirty, female, female comedians. I, I was shocked, wow, that thing, you know, they can put on Netflix, wow, I don't know. But dry bar, always clean. Yeah, yeah. I, I could do clean, I like clean comedy, you know, so, you know, I don't know when I can achieve that, but that's what I strive for. And of course, I know I need to improve my English because I people telling me I have accents. But I'll say I have heavy Alabama accents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I never met anybody in Alabama that sounded like you. So if you went to Alabama, I think you could be famous. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would be nice. That would be no, oh, that, that's a joke is because I realize people have no tolerance, no patience for immigrant if they have a accent but they have a shit ton of a patient for the southern accent right so some of the southern accents when you hear it's kind of like foreign language just like when i went to south to go to college the teacher speaking heavy alabama accents right the southern i, I couldn't understand but i put out with it i put out with it you know and it's, it's like foreign language so that's what i'm saying i go to youtube uh, to to uh, watch some southern accents, yeah, it sounds like a foreign language, it does. you know. But it is. It's but you guys dialect. have a you guys have a patience on that one, but no patience for my accents, you know. So that's why I need to borrow the Alabama. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it was a joke. I have never been to Alabama, <laughs> but I have been to Tennessee. You know, yeah, good that <laughs> yeah, good enough, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. You would be a good person to do impersonation of all the different accents because your ear picks them up. We we ignore it. Okay. I, I will try. I'll practice some real Alabama that accent. Would, that would be hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Y'all. Y'all. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bless your heart, y'all. <laughs> Alabama thing, right? I don't understand. You guys said I have an accent. Accent? You want to know an accent? I'll tell you an accent, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what would you like to talk about before our time is up? Is there anything you want to share? Uh, yeah. You you talk. You ask me what I love, right? And what? So I tell you, I like food. Uh, yeah. I I think different. Uh, Ethnicity food, it's it's a uh, excellent. You need to try it. I know some people are not willing to venture out 
to try Indian food or uh, I, I would say uh, try it. And also one thing I find out eating with a person is a very intimate thing, intimate thing. I tell you, uh, because I remember one thing I like when I date this black guy is just watch him eat. Oh my God, it was a show, you know, oh my God. And, and he can chew anything, bone, just just like cross the bone, then just, wow. And, and also, <laughs> I remember one time I was dating a, a white guy right after my divorce thing. Uh, I really, really like him, but uh, he has like just ghosted me, never respond to my text me. To this day, I still try to figure it out. And you know what I figured out? I'm guessing what was the reason. I think it was my eating. Because I remember the day with him that uh, probably my eating was bad. You know, like maybe I because I was hungry. I remember I was hungry. So I was like eating just very viciously. You know, so I remember the white people don't like this. It, it's, I like to tell this. It's not ladylike. On the date when I was like, wow. Now I remember, now I, I tell you, eating with someone is one way to find out about that person. Because eating, it is a very intimate thing. Okay, so that's one thing I love, of course, love food itself. And also eating is one way. So now, okay, I can forgive him. He doesn't like me, you know, uh, because I was eating very viciously, okay? Not ladylike. I, uh, this is my own theory. Try to figure out why he goes with me. He didn't like, I like him. Oh my God. I still, to this, how many years ago? Oh my God. I still was thinking about him, but he was not interested in me. And I, okay. Okay. But uh, I also, I remember on day, if I don't like the look when the guy eating and that was end of day, I knew there's no way there's a chance for this. So I understand eating is a good way to find out about another person okay total stranger so that's another thing i like is a travel travel because guess what travel you go to new places you learn new things it's a memory so i feel like life is not about possession it's not about how many stuff you own how big house you own, how you know a good brand cars you own. it's about what's in your memory which if I have a lot of money, I like to travel. So that comes to comedy. So I, I decided even uh, the, I guess the bookers not booking me, I'm just going to decide to uh, to travel, to do the local, the, your, Europe. Okay, start with open mic. Actually, the Zoom, a lot of uh, the UK hosts like me, they book me. So I know. So if the comedy is not taken off, at least the travel is going to take it off. So that's why I like comedy. I will. I want to comedy and travel to uh, all over the world, not just United States. So these are the two things that I I love. You know, <laughs> eating and travel. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, what you say of uh, what I hate, I tell you what I hate. I really hate this conspiracy theory or fake and the false misinformation. I tell you why China taken off and doing great the last 40 years in such a short time. You know, one thing I think played a big role is in the 1980s, China started a movement. It's called, uh, what is the truth? This was after China established relationship with China, after Nixon visited, right? But the China is still, the economy is still depressed and everything because all those years of uh, misinformation and the false information at the time of a Chairman Mao, right? So how do you turn around a country? You turn around a country, start with people's psychology, you know, so they, Deng, Deng Xiaoping started this. Deng Xiaoping, you, you, you heard that? That was the guy started the reform, open door policy in China after Mao died. So he had this discussion, debate 
in the, all the national newspaper, they ask people, what is real? What matters? What is the real, what is really happening in China? So they redefine cultural revolution to say, uh, is, is this cultural re revolution is good or bad to China? So that's waking it up to, to China, to Chinese people is start looking for truth. Instead of, ah, oh, this communist is good, you know, but I, that's another story. My family went through a lot of uh, tragedy too during Cultural Revolution. My grandpa, my mother's father, because he was a banker in, in the definition by them, it was a capitalist during the old days, right? So during Cultural Revolution, he literally fell and fell down on the ground. Nobody tried to lift him up, so he died because he was an old guy. He was, at the time, my uncle told me he was 78 years old. He was old, he was just fell down on the concrete floor. Nobody helped him out because nobody want to help a, a capitalist, you know, a, a, a bad guy. So he died. The next day, people found he was dead on the floor. Yeah. That's, that's um, you know, but anyway, so what I'm saying is the China start turning around. It's not just policy, you know, from top down. Okay, the leaders have a new policy. You have to grassroots level. The people's level have to change their thinking, change their psychology. You cannot have the false, the misinformation and the lies out there and expect a country to do good. So that's what I'm worried about right now in the United States, that you cannot just rely on the policy to beat China. Right now, you know, from Donald Trump, think uh, China is the biggest, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, I would say challenger, right? Or uh, competitor, right. you know, like the Biden right. defined China as the biggest, but you cannot beat China. Well, at the same time, in our country, we have this false information, misinformation. People it suck up people's energy, you know, like the QAnon. Suck up with all that time, with that, all that time, people consuming the false information. Why can't we channel people's energy to learn about truth, to see how that can do good for this country? You know what I'm saying? Let's just say, okay. Trump succeeded in a way to got all these people's attention to him and also QAnon succeeded in a way how many people are still believers. So what I'm saying is why you spend all that time fabricate, you know, fabricate false and try to get people's energy. If you have all that energy and time, why can't you just to give people the truth and see how, uh, what people can do with that, you know, learning about science. I, I just I want to I want to veer away from the whole political okay I got that it we're embarking on because conspiracy people think they're in the truth and then we get to where we're now art I hate the arguing but let let me ask you this before we leave two things okay I want you to tell me where all people can follow you to help your career and then I want to give you an opportunity to make us laugh all right, that's good. So you want me to tell some joke. Uh, one thing you guys can follow me is on TikTok. So my TikTok uh, handle is Yin for Yang. Yin, Y-N-G, four is number four. Yang is Y-A-N-G. Because I had one opener joke. Is My name is Yin, I'm looking for Yang. <laughs> right? So that's my opener. Uh, so just throw that joke out there. Um, so uh, that's, and also Facebook, right? And and Instagram. So I'm active on these three social media platforms. On Instagram, it's Ying Vigilon. Is it Ying Comedy Stan? Ying, Ying Comedy Stan. S T A N D. Yeah, uh, Comedy Stan. S T A N D. Yes, Comedy Stan. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So uh, I would end to tell your joke. Uh, so this is kind of a time thing uh so last year during the middle of pandemic i heard someone yelling at me at the parking lot says go back to your country 
you know, I, I look around there, nobody else. So I know it was toward me, right? So I was thinking, seriously? Yeah, if you can buy a ticket, I would love to go back to China. But problem is, China is a blocking American virus, <laughs> which would be me if I fly back there, you know, plus this year, right? This year in China have to give everybody a no swap. All the passengers landed to China, especially from the United States, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't want to do a no swap, you know, because the nozzle thing, they don't, they don't trust that. They, they think <laughs> The virus is going to stay in your body a lot longer. They trust anal. Okay, guys. <laughs> so, but, but seriously, let's be on the topic. It's so like, uh, go back to China, where I, I'm from. I can't because all my shits are here. You know what I'm saying? My house, my cat, and my Facebook account. <laughs> I can't take that to China. You know what I'm saying? They, they block everything, Google. You know, plus another information I want to tell you is, Back in China, my family already called me traitor. When I told them, I decided to become American citizen. Yeah. So, uh, but here I love American because you guys already have a traitor. So the rest of us were spared. You know, his name is Trader Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's great. That's great. And, and, uh, back to China. Uh, this is not a joke. Okay? This, my family, uh, my parents wrote me off of their will because I take American side. I want to be a United States citizen here. So I had to give up my Chinese passport. And you know, in Beijing, the real estate, each apartment was millions of dollars. So I don't have any part of that. So kind of life goes back to whole circle. Now I was a child. Once again, they didn't want. It started that way. They didn't want this extra pregnancy. You know, now once again, because I chose America, they don't want me. So yeah, you tell me, go back to my country. All right, then <laughs> let me see. <laughs> yeah, so my, my life is kind of like, uh, that's, that's my, it's my home base. My home base is my family don't want me, you know. Exactly. I have to make it for myself. I, I think hope, hopefully some bookers watching this out there and like me enough to book me, you know. Uh, if not, I just have to promote myself on social media. I do have fans. So I got a thousand followers on TikTok. So I'll grow. I'll do my own way. I, I'll do it that way. And Linda, yes, we can form a group. You know, yeah, a woman with certain age, you know, we, we can do a tour. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, when I hopefully quit my job or fire, because I got a problem with my, my boss, with my employer too. I tell you, my, my whole building of here in Spokane, we have 100 some people. I'm the only minority Asian, you know. Yeah, I know. It's all white people working that building. Yeah. So there, I think I have a problem with them not too. So that, that's enough. I just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a person always rock the boat, but definitely I'm rebellion, kind of wherever I go, you know, rebellion. <laughs> well, you're, a hard, you're willing to do all the work it takes to get where you want to go. That's been through your whole life. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I would say I'm doing okay, you know, uh, American dream, I don't know what is the yardstick, the measure about American dream. What I heard is in the Chinese community, what they define American dream is have a house, have a car, have a kids, you know, have a good career. I think I got there. I achieved it. But comedy is something I wanted to do. So I'm working on that because all the other stuff I just said is the the pressure or the stereotype or the Chinese people tell you to do, you know, that's their measure of success. It's not my measure of success. So when I have a Netflix special, I would call that a success. You know, before that, no, I'm not. I'm not. A <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, thank you, Linda. Awesome. Thank
Thank you yeah. so much. I hope you get a Netflix special. <laughs> yeah, someday. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. This is fun. And, you know, thank, thank you. you. Give me the spot. Anytime you want to come back on and plug something, if you're going to host or you're going to be at a club, I always tell people come back on for five minutes once a yeah. month. I will go back to Las Vegas. I'll, I'll look for you when I go back to Las Vegas, you know, and, and hopefully do some show in Vegas. And now we understand each other so much better. So we'll have yeah. even better time when we see each other. Yeah, we, we can be, you know, uh, sisters. Yes. You know, yeah, uh, comedy sisters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you are my role model already. You know, it's kind of like, if Linda can do it, I can do it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if that's a compliment or what, but that's, sure. yeah, I'll just tell you. Yeah. Okay. And I feel the same way about you. Okay. If you, yeah. If you can go on with everything you've been through, I, listen, if I have a bad day, I know who I'm going to call because I think you could pick me up on a bad day. Yeah. 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 I, I tell you another joke that's lo locally here in Spokane. I was like, if you can do it, you can do it, you know? Because I'm uh, English is not my uh, you know mother tongue, right? So that's what I tell them too. You know, they they speak perfect English, and if Yin can do it, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, I tell everybody, all the comics out there. Yeah, if Yin can do it, you can do it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, I remember being in Portland, and I started at age sixty three with a brain injury. I remember doing comedy with notes. And I'd tell yes. my jokes like this and people in Portland had a hard time because I couldn't remember my jokes. Uh huh. So I had to fight through that too. Yes. So uh, I remember, I really appreciate in Portland, you gave me a spot in one of the women's show. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah but that was, that was right. And I watched you, you were a very good host. Thank you. Yeah, you you didn't have a note on because by that time you were already pretty good. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I, I love to host. I would love yeah. to host every day. Yeah, if you're host, I would be happy to get on your show. Thank if you, you give me a spot, you know. Oh, there'll always be a spot for you if I'm hosting you. Always. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. And a very encouraging thing is the comedy classes I took. Uh, Flapper or uh, Ross Benny and and also Jim, the New York here. Every teacher gave me high feedback. They all like me, yeah. so they all say I I bring very good material and and just need to work on some performance. So I was very encouraged. So I know I'm onto something. You know, yes, absolutely, <laughs> you are. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to miss you already before I click to get out of here. Thank you so much for your patience for us to get on today. We had. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. I'll see you again in Vegas. Hurry. Yeah, okay. Okay. Bye. Love Bye, you. Bye, Linda. Bye. I'll click off now. Okay, me too.